<clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Credibility and Accreditations webinar. I'm just going to hang on a few seconds just to allow people to join us. Uh, we've got quite a few signed up for this morning's event. So um, hang fire for just a second. I uh, hope you've got a coffee, uh, maybe even having breakfast whilst we uh, chat this morning. Uh, but I'll be with you very soon. I'll just give it a few seconds for people to join us. Just whilst we're waiting, um, just to make sure you are in the right place. So uh, my name is Gillian Askew, I'm from Go for Growth. And this morning we'll be covering credibility and accreditations for public sector opportunities. So hopefully that's what you were hoping to come and uh, hear about and chat about this morning. Um, if not, maybe stay with us anyway, because hopefully it will be um, an insightful session. The webinars that we've got are designed to be quite high level and a little bit fast paced. So um, we are really aware and sympathetic to um, how precious time is. So we try to keep these sessions to a maximum of 45 minutes. If they do finish early, we'll not keep everybody here. Um, so um, hopefully it will be uh, fairly um, detailed, but quite high level and pretty rapid for everybody also. So whilst people are joining, let me just um, go through the agenda and some housekeeping. So the session, as always, is being recorded today um, and a copy of the recording will be sent out with the slides uh, to all registered attendees. So if you're not here, you won't hear me say this, but please don't worry if you couldn't make it, you will um, get all of the information and the recording as well. Um, because we're in Zoom, there is a Q&A or a chat function. We have had some problems just recently on webinars with the chat functionality not, not working quite so well, but the Q&A function definitely works. So if you do want to try using the chat, um, please feel free to say hi, introduce yourself. Um, if you have got any questions, if you can keep, a, keep those for the Q&A function, that would be great. Um, there is time for questions and answers at the end but ask them as we go through. And if there's anything that I need to pick up at the time, I'll do so, or we'll carve out some time at the end. If for any reason in the unlikely event that we run out of time for questions, I'll make sure that any of the questions that have been posed today are answered with the email of the slides and the recording that comes out later. So please do feel free to fire questions in. I'll keep an eye on both the Q&A and the chat throughout. So like I said, we'll be covering credibility and accreditations today. So five main chunks of that. And um, we're going to look initially at some feedback from providers. So we're going to think about the, the, the why we're even talking about credibility and accreditations this morning. We're going to then think about what credibility means in the context of um, public procurement. So what could you be thinking about that might help bolster your credibility? And what will the public sector be thinking about in terms of credibility? We're just going to have a think about accreditation. So what I'm not doing is going to make suggestions about which accreditations, which sector of businesses should have, because it can really differ from procurement to procurement. But we will just uh, think about accreditations more generally. And then I'll talk you through uh, something called RICE, which um, if you are sporty at all, might mean to you rest, ice, compression and elevation, but it's not. Um, it's about other things that, that might be able to help in terms of public procurement. And then uh, we'll have a look at grounds for exclusion. So if anybody on the call today came along to any of the lunch and learns that we did on bid skills, and especially the first one, the 6th of March for the standard selection questionnaire, you might have seen some of the grounds for exclusion before. But if you haven't, um, I'll be going through really briefly uh, some of the grounds for exclusion today. So I'm... Um, who, who are we? So I'm Gillian Askew. I'm one of the co-founders of Go for Growth. Um, the, the Go for Growth is an organisation um, who are funded by the public sector, um, offering support to the marketplace to develop. Um, and what we're trying to do is help providers in the marketplace and especially smaller providers, small to medium enterprises, micro businesses, sole traders and the voluntary sector to be able to find and secure opportunities for growth in the public sector. And what that isn't all about is the bid process, although obviously that procurement process is hugely important and it's and it's pivotal to, to securing some opportunities, especially at the higher value ones in public sector. But we're minded to think about the whole of the life cycle in public sector and we're minded to try and support people throughout that entire life cycle. Um, 
offering personalized and individual support for businesses so that um, you get the help and support as and when you need it and the type of help and support that you need. So the core team in Go For Growth is myself. I'm joined by my colleague, Lauren, um, and Jimmy and Sherry Lee, but we've also got uh, our colleagues, Sandra and Bex and Millie and Mike, who uh, are regularly working with us in the Go For Growth team. Um, we're also um, a small business, so we understand the process of working for the public sector. And personally, I'm a, a procurement professional with 30 years in, in procurement, both private sector and public sector. So I've walked a mile in both pairs of shoes. So hopefully that helps us bring to the table some um, important intelligence and insight when we're supporting providers and the public sector. And so if we think about what providers have been telling us about um, uh, accreditations and, and uh, credibility, we've been chatting to and polling providers for well over the last 18 months now. Um, and what you can see on screen are just a handful of things that providers are, are telling us. So 53% of providers, when we've chatted to them, have said, actually, I'm just not sure which accreditations I need in order to be able to win work in the public sector. That said, and I think probably linked to that, 45%, that third stat on the screen, 45% of providers that we talk to have got more than three accreditations. And, and the, the vast majority of providers that are, are answering these polls would consider themselves a small business or a micro business. So up to 49 employees in size. So at that size of business to have more than three accreditations, um, that's pretty meaningful, I think. Um, and then 22% actually said they would almost certainly decline to bid if they had to go and get additional accreditations on top of what they'd already got in place. Um, and when we've talked about financial credibility, specifically 30% of providers that we've chatted to have said, actually, that feels like a fairly complicated area and would like some support and help to understand what financial credibility means. And, you know, why is that important? Well, it, it, you know, it's clear to us that the providers are still finding the whole um, credibility and accreditation stuff challenging. And, and today's session will attempt to cover some very high level information. Um, but there is a message from me uh, that Go For Growth is here to help outside of this webinar just as much as we're trying to help within it. We're here all of the time to help. So, our contact details are at the end. If you want to chat through credibility, how to put your credibility together, how to you know, build the narrative for a procurement competition, how to approach accreditations, what to do if somebody's asking you for something that you don't have or you've got an equivalent, that kind of thing, do feel free to come and chat to us. We are free of charge to access because we're funded by the public sector. So do get in touch um, uh, and we'll do everything that we can to help. If we uh, think about credibility uh, and what does it mean? So public sector buyers, in essence, are trying to gain confidence through whatever process it is that they're using, um, that whoever they award the work to can deliver at the level that's required and for the duration of the contract or project or whatever it might be. And in part, they're going to do that through the selection criteria. And in part, they do that through uh, the quality and technical questions and, and therefore the evaluation criteria. Um, and the selection criteria, which is at the front end, um, that's a look back at, at what you have and what you've done. Um, so things like um, your financial credibility will be in that selection criteria. Um, you will be asked about things like insurances um, and accreditations in that selection criteria. Uh, however, there will often be a caveat with insurances and accreditation specifically that you won't necessarily need to have them in place for the point of bid, but you may have to have them in place either for contract start date or for a date um, in the future. And actually it's worth noting that um, obviously, post Brexit, we are um, uh, rewriting, if you like, the public procurement regulations, and they've been in consultation. And they're now uh, the bill is going through Parliament. I think it's at third reading or coming up to third reading in Parliament. And and what that will enshrine in the regulatory capacity is that um, public sector organisations um, won't be able to say you must have these things in place at point of bid. Um, 
And that is to try and, and take pressure off bidding organisations incurring cost when they haven't yet actually won any work. And so you should only incur any cost for an accreditation or insurance policy that you do need to take out that could be additional to your organisation when you've actually won the work and therefore you have almost certainly uh, priced that into your uh, application. So um, that hopefully is a, is a real positive. Um, but when we've talked to our public sector buyers, we, we have been asking around the kinds of things that help to demonstrate that credibility. So um, for example, in the NHS, if you've worked for an NHS trust already, um, for example, uh, one of the trusts that we work for is the Great Ormond Street um, Hospital. Uh, we work for Guys and St Thomas's, we work for Lewisham and Greenwich. Um, being able to tell other NHS trusts that we are experienced at working in that arena is really helpful. It helps to build our basic credibility. Of course, what it doesn't tell anyone is how we've performed, but um, if we are on current contract, one might assume, therefore, that uh, it isn't going too badly. So uh, it can often be useful to talk about who you've worked before. Think about whether you profile that on your website, on your social media, on, on the public domain that is your business. Does it tell people who you work for? Does it tell people who you've worked for before, even if you no longer do? So you might have done a project that was finite or a, a finite contract, but you worked for that brand. Do you celebrate that? Are you public about it? Um, do you talk about your customers? Um, often do you do you join any conversations on social media? Do you tag your customers in an appropriate way when you're talking about things that are important to them? Um, and of course, case studies, testimonials, references, they're all really great ways of being able to show a potential new customer what your existing or previous customers experience was. So it's it's about you, but not said by you. And that can be really powerful. And in a poll that we did, and I think the statistics on our website, actually 62% of businesses told us that they don't have case studies or testimonials or any references ready. And in the selection part of a, a public procurement, you will be almost certainly asked about references um, of people who you've worked for before on similar types of contracts or public sector contracts. And you'll be asked to... Um, uh, try and give up to three references. There will be a, an equivalent if you are starting out and you don't yet have those references, um, you can uh, write your own testimonial in a, in a public sector. But if you're a pretty established organisation, whatever size you are and in whatever sector, it can often be a really powerful thing to have those case studies, testimonials or references ready to use and ready to talk about. Um, if you wanted to have a look at the Go for Growth website, we've just recently added some case studies uh, to our website. So we've got case studies from providers who we've supported through public sector uh, opportunities and also case studies from our customers. And we have PDF versions and we have video versions. So you can watch a video and listen to our customers and providers talk about the work that we do, but also you can read one if that is your preference. So um, feel free to just have a look there. You know, we're not saying that they're the best things since sliced bread, but um, they might give you some ideas. Um, promoting your organisation is really important, but it can often be challenging. So when a public sector competition is live, um, you are almost locked out of the, the organisation that you are trying to win that work with in that you can have conversations with them. You can ask questions, but through the clarification process in a procurement, what you won't be able to do is um, outside of that procurement process, promote or sell your organisation. So it's a, it's a thing that needs to be organic, really. And public sector buyers tell us that that isn't about uh, cold emailing or um, uh, sending LinkedIn messages, but it is about joining conversations or targeted conversations via email or, or LinkedIn or whatever that really take the narrative that the organisation is talking about and aligning your narrative with that in by way of promoting your organization and you can do that also by um, talking about awards that you might have won or conferences that you might have been to that voice that you have and the ability to use that voice to put it in front of potential customers to say here is me this is what I do and this is how we do it and this is why we're good um, can often be 
really quite powerful. You, you are connecting dots, I think, um, for public sector organisations. Bear in mind that those things aren't the things that win you bids. The thing that wins you work is and will always be what you write down in the competition. But outside of that, you you want to build a profile that says um, to anybody who is looking, because not everything will go through a contract. Um, this is this is who I am. This is what I do. And this is why we're good at it. And it can be quite useful to talk about any membership schemes that you might be a part of. So, um, for example, uh, Go for Growth are really proud members of a, a number of local chambers of commerce. We're also really proud members of the Yorkshire Asian Business Association. And we're uh, proud also uh, members of the London Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we use those membership schemes to help um, drive our business forward to help raise awareness of who we are and what we do. And those membership schemes um, can be sectoral or they can be um, uh, category led. So we work with the Ministry of Justice. And so therefore, we also uh, are building a really good relationship with clinks who support the voluntary sector in the justice sector. So those membership organisations and those membership schemes can be really important. Um, and then, of course, there is financial stability and financial credibility. So in, in a procurement sense, you'll be asked about your accounts. Can you give the last two years audited accounts? If not, there will be equivalents that you can give, which might be a balance sheet. Uh, it might be a statement from your accountant um, or a cash flow statement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if before you get there, if you think about your financial stability, so um, how big is your business versus the size of opportunity? That can be really important. If you're turning over a hundred thousand um, a year, and what you're bidding for is a million pounds worth of business, then that's a huge leap in terms of the size of business. So you need to think about and be able to demonstrate how you would go from that size business to that size business and how you would have credibility in doing so and be stable and able to deliver the contract over that period. Do you know if you were successful in winning it, how you would scale up in the time that you would have for implementation? Um, if a customer in the public sector is going to be 60, 70, 80, 90% of your turnover, that potentially could worry them because um, if you weren't successful in retaining that work at a future date, they understand the consequence of that on your organisation. And so financial stability and that credibility in, in proportion to the size of the contract that you're going for is a useful exercise to work through, I think, as a business before you uh, put pen to paper for that opportunity. Um, you can think about your liquidity days, for example, in terms of your financial credibility. So if no more money came in, how long can you trade on what you've currently got in the bank? Um, and it can be a really helpful um, uh, kind of analysis to do just for yourself, for your own business. Think about what your credit rating would show. Obviously, we are still um, getting over the pandemic. And so credit ratings during uh, the pandemic did get hammered actually for lots of businesses, but having your back pocket what that credit rating will show, are you uh, bidding for a contract where you would have to go through um, any kind of uh, benchmarking scheme for um, your financial viability? Um, what does your, you know, what kind of risk would you pose to the public sector? Um, Public sector organisations want to be sure that you can afford to run your business and deliver those goods or services over the life of the contract. So if there's a downturn in that, how will you manage it? Um, values and volumes are rarely, if ever, guaranteed, and they're even less likely to be underwritten. So can you manage if there's volatility? Are you recruiting to this, which is a real positive from a social value perspective? But if there was um, any volatility in the um, amount of work that you got through, would you be able to manage and, and retain that recruitment position? Um, and then actually there are things called um, parent company guarantees. And, and you might see in a selection criteria that you might be asked if you're part of a parent company. And if you have got a parent company, you might be asked to um, uh, give copies of your parent company accounts or a parent company guarantee. 
Um, if you don't have one or an alternative to a PCG might be a project or performance type bond, uh, they can often be asked for in construction. And what they do is they, in all cases, these things are, are guaranteeing the performance of the contract or they protect it on default of the contract. They're usually required at the time of contract signing. Um, there are a couple of links for more information on uh, parent company guarantees um, and bonds that we'll send out with the notes uh, for this. But if you have a think about your financial credibility at the stage of you at as a business, in proportion to the, the amount of contract that you are um, attempting or amount of business that you are attempting to secure, how will you look and feel when it's all written down to whoever is, um, whoever is looking at it from a public sector perspective? From a, an accreditations perspective then, um, the first thing I've put on screen is what accreditations does your business need to, to operate. So uh, I used to run a, a stray dog kennels and a, and a care farm business where, um, as well as uh, looking after stray dogs, we offered animal uh, plant and land and animal based experiences for vulnerable children and adults. And I actually didn't need any accreditations to be able to compliantly or lawfully operate. Um, all I actually needed was a license. I needed to be insured and I needed a handful of policies like health and safety and safeguarding, but I didn't actually need any accreditations. However, um, we decided to become CHAS accredited because of the health and safety risks involved in uh, dealing with stray dogs and, and dealing with vulnerable children. And we also opted to become CVAS accredited, which is the Countryside Educational Visits Accreditation Scheme, to show our potential customers that we were able to operate educational visits on our farm. Um, and so we got those accreditations because they helped to demonstrate that credibility to our customer. And they also set us apart from other organizations that we were competing with. Um, and so when you think about your uh, accreditations, you will be thinking about what the need is. So you do, do you need anything to operate? If you're in construction, um, that will be a yes. There'll be some sort of uh, construction scheme, uh, health and safety scheme that you would probably need to have an accreditation to. If you're dealing with lots of personal data, uh, you may well need to be cyber essentials accredited, but think about the need versus actually will an accreditation um, add value to my business? Will it set me apart from our competitors? Will it help me demonstrate my credibility to my customer? Think about are there any that you have to have to be compliant. So, um, and that might be a registration as opposed to accreditation. Do you need to be CQC registered, the Care Quality Commission registered to be able to offer the services to the client that you want to offer them to? Um, and you can think about what your customers are asking for and why. So um, there is an example that we had. Um, it was a, a local authority who was looking for air conditioning maintenance. And one of the bidders, uh, they were asking for a specific accreditation. One of the bidders um, had what was in their view an equivalent and potentially superior accreditation to the one that was being asked. If you have something that you think does the job, but isn't exactly the same thing that the contracting authority or your potential customer is asking for, our advice would be ask <clears throat> if it's a competition through the clarification questions process, or if it's a non-competition or if it's a grant application, ask the grant funder, ask whoever uh, it is in whatever the appropriate way is, if they will accept an equivalent. And what you should see, good practice in public sector, excuse me, <clears throat> should see that um, there should be an or equivalent more often than not. That's good practice for a, a, a contracting authority to say, we want this or equivalent. So we want um, information assurance, um, ISO 27001 or equivalent. And if you're a small to medium enterprise, the IASME accreditation might be a really good equivalent, the information assurance for small to medium enterprises. So if you've got something and you think that that would fit the bill, then definitely ask the customer or also think about why the customer is asking for it. And if you don't really understand what the fit is, do ask. Those, those clarification questions are there for a reason. Ask, uh, ask why and see if you can get a handle on, on, on why 
it's needed and that might be helpful in deciding for you whether you're going to go and get it. But you're always going to think about the cost of getting and then keeping the accreditation. So um, none of these are free. Uh, they often have an annual cost. Um, in addition to the cost to going to get it in the first place, uh, our CHAS accreditation, we had to redo it from scratch every year. Otherwise, the accreditation lapsed. Uh, the CVAS accreditation, however, was a one off. So each accreditation will potentially have a, a different um, a long term cost of retention, but they will all, generally speaking, um, have a cost of getting them. And you'll need to think about that, obviously, in, um, in proportion to whether you want it or need it or whether it, you can cost it into the opportunity that you're currently pricing. The feedback that we give the public sector is larger businesses often, and it's the same with insurances, carry more accreditations, more policies, more insurances as standard because they're bigger, they can afford to do so, and their breadth of what they're doing may be greater. Whereas smaller organisations, that can often be really difficult. And there is a fear from smaller organisations and the voluntary sector that um, if they cost in additional accreditations or licenses or whatever it might be, that that would then render them uncompetitive on a cost basis. So we're encouraging the public sector to keep that in their mind uh, when they are putting together what they're asking for. And that's why the or equivalent can be really useful. Um, but also to, to make sure that some of these baselines um, are priced appropriately. So here is the cost of doing business and here is the cost of the accreditations so that potentially they can be separated out. So it is something that is a little challenging still to this day, but we are definitely working with the public sector to, um, to try and um, help them understand this environment and what it means to, especially to smaller organisations. Um, but those are the things that you'll be thinking about uh, when you are looking at accreditations. And so RICE, uh, making it work. So I can't take any um, uh, uh, credit for this. Uh, so I worked with a colleague uh, called Duncan uh, Spokes who uh, put this together for a previous version of the credibility and accreditations webinar that we did. We've done a couple already. Um, so Duncan put RISE together, but actually um, I think it, it really makes sense um, uh, and stands the test of time. So the, the hour of RISE is all about research, making sure that you understand how public sector organisations approach their procurement activity, what do they want? What do they need? What are they trying to do? Um, and, and do you know where you would fit into that is really important. So if you're wanting to work for an NHS trust, they're really rooted as an anchor institution and they're really learning and trying to learn about their local economic impact as well as their local social impact. And so they, they understand that they're rooted in the local economy and have a role to play in bolstering that local economy. So if you can think about how you would fit into that, um, then that's great. That's a narrative that you can use. You can understand your customer better and that will definitely stand you in good stead when you're putting together a response to any sort of application for funding. Um, so inform, be informed and inform your potential customer. And that's what we were talking about in terms of outside of a competition. Can you let them know what you're doing? Can you go to meet the buyer events? Um, are you innovating? Um, do you know what's coming? So um, most, well, in the, um, uh, the National Procurement Policy Statement, Public sector organisations now have to publish a pipeline. So um, do you know what opportunities are coming? Are you ready for them? Are you informed about them? Um, and do you have your uh, building blocks in place, your ducks in a row? Do you, are, you, are you ready to take part? And where are you being seen? Are you, are you going to meet the buyer events? Are you, you, know, are you joining conversations um, on social media and letting your customer know what you're doing? How visible are you to your client? How can you be more visible to your client? Um, and then the C that collaborates, if you're members of chambers or the Federation of Small Businesses or any trade bodies or membership based organizations, they are there to help you leverage in your marketplace 
definitely use them. They're great organizations. You've paid for your membership. Um, if you're not already using them, uh, uh, you know, our advice would be definitely do. Um, but then also there is that collaboration as in working with other suppliers where it's appropriate to do so, potentially to strengthen the offer that you have. Um, and we've got a whole session de dedicated in June um, and again in November, I think, dedicated to collaboration, how to do it, how to partner, how to work together, um, and then offering opportunities for businesses who want to find other organisations to work with, um, to be able to meet and greet and have a chat and all the rest of it. So there's two types of collaboration there, using that network that's around you to, to, to lobby or engage to introduce you to people, they've, they've usually got, you know, chambers of commerce have usually got really strong connections into, uh, into public sector, use them as much as you can, and then where appropriate, um, use work with other suppliers to strengthen your offer. And then E is all about evidence. As, as, as part of your responses in whatever process it is, um, whatever you're saying you, uh, you can do, um, try and evidence where you can. Um, so ask yourself the so what question. So, um, you know, what you're not going to be writing is I'm amazing at this um, and thinking that that will do uh, what you would be saying is actually here is what the question is. Uh, do you provide care plans? Yes, we do. Here is an example of the care plan. Here is, you know, a redacted version of one that we've used. This was the success of it. You will you will answer the question and provide evidence that um, uh, that what you've said is 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 what you actually do and i think those things are really important when you think about any public procurement process that you go through what you write down in your responses they become contractualized so you'll be held to account for those and if you can't deliver on them um, then you are effectively uh, potentially in breach of contract so um you know, if you're evidencing what you're doing, you're really demonstrating credibility to your potential customer that this isn't um, just what you've written down. You're able to back it up with some evidence as well. And then finally, um, exclusion grounds. So there are two types of exclusions. If you um, came to the, the lunch and learn on the 6th of March, you will have seen this before. So I'm going to really whistle through it. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time. Um, we'll send a document round with the slide deck, which is, is a government document that's publicly available. And it goes through in detail all the, the grounds for exclusion. However, what you can see on screen uh, are grounds for mandatory exclusion. Um, and they constitute really obviously some substantial issues. If you've fallen foul of any of those mandatory exclusions in terms of convictions, it, it's, it's highly likely that you'd be excluded from the, the competition and therefore unable to proceed. And there are very few exceptions to that rule. Um, there are um, just a couple. So um, in scope organisations in limited circumstances might disregard the existence of any grounds for mandatory exclusion, but it's confined on an exceptional basis to where there are overriding reasons relating to public interest, such as public health or protection of the environment. And then there are some um, things around that tax breach of tax obligations where if um, you didn't have the opportunity to pay or agree to pay the outstanding amounts prior to the deadline to submit um, or participate in a tender, or if you've already paid uh, back those um, outstanding sums, then there are a couple of exceptions, but that's it. If you fall foul of mandatory exclusions, it's, it's likely to be um, uh, an, an inability to continue. In the case of discretionary exclusions, the regulations allow for, but don't mandate that bidders should be excluded under certain grounds. Unlike mandatories, they don't cover specific criminal offences. And so therefore the decision to exclude on anything that is uh, classed as a discretionary um, exclusion will be taken on a case by case basis by the contracting authority. And so, um, we're just coming up to time for questions, but um, these are our contact details at Go for Growth. If you want to have a chat with us about anything that we've talked about today, or if you'd just like some help um, about anything to do with public sector or growing in the public sector, grant applications, um, as well as um, full on contracts or any other public sector process in between, here's where you can get us. Um, please do give us a shout. 
um, and you can um, book uh, on that bookable calendar. You can book a 30 minute team session if you want or give us a call or drop us an email. Uh, we are really happy to help as much as we possibly can. And so that's it. That's over to you guys. Um, we've got some time for questions. I've been checking uh, the, the Q&A throughout. There aren't any as it stands at the minute. Um, if anybody's got any, please do feel free to chuck them in the Q&A uh, in the last couple of minutes. Um, if there aren't any, that's no problem. Um, I won't hold us all here. Um, if there is anything that you think about outside of this that you want us to uh, answer, as I said, our contact details are in the slide deck please do feel free to get in touch. Um, also, if there's a topic that you really want us to cover in a webinar, um, then give us a shout. Um, we will probably pop out a short survey just to ask you how you found today, was the information, what you thought it was going to be, how did the time work, how was the duration? We don't want to, to do webinars that aren't adding value to people. So if we're not getting the time right or the content right or the, the duration right, uh, we really, really want to hear about it. We probably want to hear what's not working more than we want to hear what it is. So please do feel free to tell us um, what's happening um, and we will do uh, everything we can to, to make these as, as good and as informative as possible. Um, and um, Julie, thank you for saying that was very useful. I'm glad you found it um, of some value. So. Um, if there is anything else we can do, please do get in touch. If not, um, I will say goodbye. Thank you all so much for joining. I really appreciate you taking some time out um, and hopefully we'll see you again on another webinar. Thank you all.